On stage, we'll have uh, Marco Palladino, CTO and uh, co-founder of Kong, um, about how to achieve zero trust security with Kuma Service Mesh. Hello, Marco. How are you? Hello, Mary. Como ça va? Ça va bien? Yeah, que coche questo? <laughs> <laughs> Everything is going very well. Yeah, things are going well uh, uh, for us um, and also uh, for Kong, uh, from what I heard. Uh, so, yeah, and, and, and thank you for being there again with us. Uh, we really wanted to have you to finish this track on, let's say, distributed architecture scalability uh, by mixing what we talked about, security and distributed architecture, by this zero trust principle. Uh, and how you can apply it with uh, with service mesh and with the uh, uh, and so with Kuma. So the stage is yours for twenty minutes, and we will be back for questions. Sounds good. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Marco Palladino. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Kong. I work with uh, the community and enterprise organizations that are trying to simplify the lives of the application teams by providing them reliable connectivity at the infrastructure level. The more services our teams are going to be creating and the more applications they're going to be creating and the more important connectivity becomes at the backbone of all of these new applications. If connectivity is down, the application is down. So how can we, the architects, provide to the teams reliable connectivity that is always secure, always reliable, always observable? And truly, this is the bread and butter of uh, what Kong does and what my work at Kong really entails, to help create a reliable grid so that all the services we create across containers, Kubernetes, but also virtual machines, can run properly for the years to come. So let's talk about trust. Trust is uh, an interesting concept. Trust is exploitable. When our teams are creating services and applications, we cannot simply trust that whenever there is a new request coming in, that request is identified, that request should happen in the first place. So we need to remove the concept of trust within our systems, hence the word zero trust. Remove the concept of trust. Likewise, when we travel to a different country, we have to show a passport that validates our identity. Likewise, our services also have to show a virtual passport, if you wish, to provide to their identity and to verify that they are who they say they are. Imagine a world without a real passport. Without a passport and without an identity, essentially, the immigration officer would have to trust us that we are who we claim we are. Now, of course, that has security risk. Um, eventually, some malicious actor will claim that they are uh, they're a criminal, but they claim they are, you know, they have no bad intentions and they'll enter the country. Of course, we cannot rely on trust in what the service or in this case, the person tells us to determine if they are who they really are. We must provide them with a passport. The passport validates that their identity is valid. And based on that identity, we can then implement permission rules that can determine if that person should enter immigration or not. This is literally what we want to do with our services as well. Transitioning to microservices, it is an opportunity for us to improve security. I'll repeat this statement. Transitioning to microservices, it is a chance for us to improve our security. And that may sound weird. How is it possible that we're decoupling a monolith into microservices? We have all of these different services running. How is it possible that security could potentially be better? Well, it can be better because it's an opportunity for us to finally remove the concept of trust, which the monolith implements since day one. In a monolithic application, everything can consume everything else. Remove that concept of trust, assign an identity to every service, and then based on that identity, implement traffic permission checks. We need virtual passports for our services. At the same time, we don't want the teams to build this from scratch whenever they create a new service or whenever there is a, um, a new application that they're building. We want to make sure that this identity is being delivered by the underlying infrastructure in such a way that it works on containers, on virtual machines, across any technology stack. In a monolithic application, so for example, let's take a look at this very simple example. This is a marketplace application. We're going to be having different 
um, resources like users and items and invoices that we're going to be issuing. And, and typically these resources are encapsulated into objects that um, anybody can consume from within the same runtime. So we're going to be having a user class, an item class, and so on and so forth. And from within the code base, nothing prevents us from writing code that potentially does things we should not be doing, you know, by creating invoices when we shouldn't be doing that or deleting a user. We have to trust that the teams and the, and the developers are doing the right thing, and there is no malicious actor uh, that does something they're not intended to do. Typically, in a monolith, this means that essentially everything can invoke everything else. Uh, there are ways we can limit the visibility of our functions and our objects, but typically everything is one PR away from being um, exposed again. And it's not really a secure system. Now, when we decouple our objects into separate services, because we want to build them independently, we want to scale them independently, well, now, of course, we have an opportunity of being applying zero trust to secure how all of these resources are being created. Um, our user service, item service, become independent services that can receive a, and return a response over the network. And all of those network requests can now be protected with networking infrastructure that we can apply for the entire organization. And I'm going to be showing you a demo today on how we're going to be doing this in one click, by the way, one click to manage not only the assignment of the identities, but also manage the rotation of the TLS certificates that provides that identity in the first place. So creating an identity is obviously step number one. We must have an identity, otherwise everything else cannot be implemented. We must know who the services are when they make a request or when a request is being received. And, and on top of that identity, we, don't, we want to then apply permissions that allow us to determine what operations or what services can do, uh, can submit that request. Assigning an identity, it's step number one. On top of that identity, determining what permissions we want to execute, it's step number two. So in this example, for you know, we want the invoices services to be able to consume the item service, but not vice versa. That's a very simple traffic permission we can implement. And, and this check um, could be done by the services themselves. So we could ask our teams, hey, you know what? Create an identity and then create a permission and write more code to um, provide all of this functionality. Or we could be using a service mesh to give this identity and these traffic permissions to the teams since they won as part of the underlying infrastructure provisioning without having to ask them to create any sort of code. Most importantly, because a service mesh, it's a platform agnostic uh, pattern, it can run across any uh, technology stack, any language, any service, any cloud potentially in our organization. Typically, uh, the identity of our services in a zero trust architecture uh, is being assigned as a, a SAN, as a subject alternative name in a TLS, in the originating TLS certificate that's making the request. SAN, it's an extension to uh, you know, X509, which is a standard that is being used to create public key certificates. And that's very common. We can see that um, you know, in use every time we visit an HTTPS website protected by TLS. And as a matter of fact, uh, if we you know, use Chrome and inspect the certificate of, uh, for example, in this case, Google's uh, homepage, uh, under TLS, we can then verify what the subject alternative names field are for that certificate. Essentially, we can add custom data to a certificate and we make sure that the custom data we are adding, it is certified by the, the, the underlying TLS certificate. So essentially, if we want to assign a name or an identity to our service, essentially the service name would be a field in the SAN of that certificate that we're creating for the for the for that service. Whenever that request is being sent, the destination service can then parse these fields to validate that the service really is who they claim they are. Essentially, this is how we are assigning a first name and a last name to every service in our infrastructure. Then, of course, once we have this uh, identity in place we can um, extract the name and then apply our permissions. Now, I'm going to be showing you with Kuma and Kong Mesh. So Kong Mesh is the product uh, that uh, Kong is um, uh, you know, created 
uh, when it comes to enterprise service meshes. And Cumi is the underlying core that, uh, by the way, it's a CNCF project. So we are uh, contributors to both. And Cuma, it's built on top of Envoy Proxy when it comes to the data plane technology. Uh, and it's available today with the same openness and the same neutrality as any other open source project in CNCF. Um, it's easy to use. It provides policies out of the box for pretty much anything. Uh, there is quite a substantial adoption in the community and in the enterprise landscape when it comes to Cuma. But with Cuma, we can provide, Cuma is a service mesh uh, that can allow us to provide zero trust in one click among the other features that it provides. When we look at Cuma from a you know, high level standpoint, essentially Cuma is a control plane that allows us to configure a fleet of envoys. It is multi-cloud by default. There is nothing else that's required to support a multi-cloud or a multi-cluster or a hybrid VMs and container infrastructure because the service mesh ships with these features since day one. That, that's the underlying architecture of the service mesh. Um, it can run across uh, one, one zone or multiple zone. And in the demo, I'm going to be showing you uh, how we're running these essentially, um, you know, pretty much um, on multiple clouds, including a hybrid of VMs and containers. And it's being used by over 900 organizations today in production. The service mesh, um, Cuma, it's easy to use. It's multi-mesh. It supports Kubernetes and VMs natively. When supporting a service mesh for the entire org, it is very important that we can deploy this to the teams that are far away in their Kubernetes journey and the ones that are not there yet. That's why the VM support ships since day one. And it provides a built-in multi-zone connectivity that ships within the mesh with no third-party system required to make this work. The multi-zone, it's actually quite interesting and quite unique. This has been engineered to, for uh, reliability, for compartmentalization, and to maximize the uptime of the service mesh. Making sure that the service mesh is always up and running, it's an incredible challenge. And that's why we built Kuma with this architecture in such a way that we have a global control plane, which is the primary control plane, that um, accepts all the service mesh policies like zero trust that we want to implement. And automatically these policies are going to be propagated and reconciled across all these zones, it can be a platform, can be a cloud, can be a cluster that we want to support as part of that mesh. We make a distributed service mesh as easy as running it in one cluster, even though it could run across multiple clouds, multiple environments and multiple uh, even hybrid containers and VMs. Again, this has been engineered for enterprise environments where we're going to be having a lot of everything and we must deploy a service mesh that can work across all of these environments. Of course, propagating the policy is one thing and then enabling that cross zone connectivity from one region to another, from one zone to another, it's something that also ships out of the box. It is incredibly easy to deploy, incredibly easy to use. And there is a community Slack channel. You can also, um, you know, if you have any questions with Cuma, there is a, community, Slack, you can ask any questions, the team and the contributors and, and, and the community can help you with any problem or any feedback you may have. It ships with a GUI out of the box, it ships with CRDs out of the box, there is an API out of the box, there is a CLI native out of the box, and it ships with policies that we can apply for zero trust, for routing, for L checking, for circuit breaking, for all sorts of things on top of our service mesh. Again, this is going to be working across any uh, application Kubernetes containers, Fargate, ECS, as well as um, as well as uh, VMs. It ships with charts out of the box, a native API gateway integration to expose uh, our services, uh, uh, you know, to either another team or at the edge via a full cycle API management solution. Of course, there is a native integration with Kong, the gateway, uh, and Zero Trust is a one click ordeal. So I'm going to be showing it in just a second. To enable zero trust, uh, we must enable um, these uh, policy, essentially. We are going to be having multiple meshes. There is one mesh called default mesh. And the default mesh can uh, essentially have support for multiple types of uh, certificate authority backends. The built-in type allows us to uh, create automatic CA for you. You can rotate the certificate every day. You can expire that CA 10 years from now. And this is literally all it takes to issue an identity, rotate the certificate across hundreds of thousands of data plane proxies running across multiple clouds, containers, and Kubernetes, and VMs. One resource, one click, literally. That's all it takes. Um, and then once we have done that, we can use another policy called traffic permission to determine how we want our traffic to flow. We can then determine who I want all sorts of traffics from every service to be able to consume any other service uh, in, the, in the service mesh. Of course, 
we can then apply more stringent rules if we want to. This is a very liberal <laughs> traffic permissions, essentially it allows all traffic. Uh, and in Kong Mesh, on top of this identity, we can also apply OPA. We, we heard team talking about Styra just recently. Stara and uh, Kong are partners. We're working together to provide a great OPA experience on top of Service Mesh. Uh, you can leverage Styra as the underlying uh, storage for your uh, OPA policies, or you could use the native OPA policy of Kong Mesh. Long story short, on top of this identity, we can provide a service mesh that runs across every uh, uh, application since day one. And in Kong Mesh, which is the enterprise schema, if you wish, we don't even have to require an additional OPA sidecar because we baked the OPA agent within the same data plane proxy that runs Envoy. So there is no additional agent we have to run to execute uh, OPA in Kong Mesh. All right, let's look at a quick demo right now. So let me pull up my uh, environments here. So I am going to show you that I have my service mesh running simultaneously on GKE and Amazon. Let me uh, pull up EC2 on my other screen. And there we go. So we do have uh, three clusters running on Kubernetes uh, with Kong Mesh. Uh, one is the global cluster, then we have East, we have West. And we also have the same service mesh spanning across another cloud in, other, in another region running on virtual machines. I don't know how many uh, demos you have seen of a service mesh that can run simultaneously across VMs and containers. I bet not many, uh, but this is one of them. So we're going to be seeing how we can connect to the global control plane and see what is the status of our mesh. So right now, I'm going to be connecting to this uh, global control plane and then expose the underlying GUI that we are going to be using to uh, look at the system. So first and foremost, there is an API that we can integrate pretty much for you know, automation and all sorts of things. But the GUI is built on top of that same API. So there's everything you're seeing in the GUI can also be automatically provisioned or automated through the API. And we do have three different zones, EC2 East, uh, EC2, GK East, GK West. So it's containers and VMs mixed together. And I have a very simple demo application. Essentially, it's a counter app. It allows me to increment a counter on Redis. So let's go and consume that application from um, EC2. Depending on what Redis instance I, I consume, it's going to tell me the zone that I am consuming. And so right now, we are consuming uh, the, the Redis on Amazon EC2. Let's go ahead and implement zero trust in such a way that we can have cross-zone communication. Right now, I only have one mesh. You can have as many as you want for applications, for different teams, different business units. But mutual TLS is disabled. So let's go ahead and check out the QMA policies, uh, like, for example, mutual TLS. Um, I'm going to be running a built-in certificate, although we support AshiCorp Vault as a third-party PKI. Uh, there is, uh, you can provide your own certificates. Um, you can also ask the system to generate all of this for, from scratch, uh, you know, the CA from scratch in such a way that there is nothing really you need to do. Let me uh, create the kubectl command that we're going to be using to enable, essentially we're going to be enabling uh, a mutual TLS uh, zero trust in the default mesh. We're gonna instruct the system to create a built-in certificate authority, and then we're going to be rotating our certificates every day. When I do that against my global control plane, Automatically, we're going to be storing this policy, propagating it across each zone that we have. It's all automatic. Then within each zone, we're going to be distributing the key root certificate and key for the built-in uh, CA. And automatically, we're going to be issuing certificates to our data plane proxies. All of this is automated. In one click, this is spanning across both Kubernetes and containers, VMs across multiple clouds and multiple regions. Uh, so let's take a look what happens. When I do that, I am going to be entering this resource. There's going to be an interruption of connectivity because now we are enabling zero trust. We're issuing that certificate. And as you can see, we have cross zone connectivity that's secure encrypted across both VMs and containers with, with Kong Mesh and Cuma. This is how easy it is to run something as complex as this demo on, uh, by, by using this technology. Simplicity is a feature, ease of use is a feature, and we certainly put lots of focus and effort to make sure that this service mesh, um, fully supported in the enterprise by Kong, could, could run as easy as possible in your environments. All right, so let me go back to my slides here. 
Uh, today, we looked at the importance of connectivity. The more services, the more applications, and the more connectivity we generate. We have to have something in place to manage and secure this connectivity. A service mesh can help us with that. One of the features that service mesh provides, it's zero trust. Removing the concept of trust to provide an identity and certificates to every single um, service our teams are running across both containers and VMs. And we took a look at Kong Mesh built on top of Kuma, which allows us to do all of that in a couple of clicks across multiple clouds, multiple environments in a native way, uh, including the rotation of those data plane proxy certificates. You can download Kuma at kuma.io. Uh, you can replicate my demo quite easily. And if you're looking at uh, the enterprise offering for your organization, you can also check Kong Mesh, which is built on top of Kuma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, we have one question again. It's the same I asked about service mesh earlier, but uh, some some companies ask uh, the um, the fact that uh, if you think you need service mesh, um, you probably don't need it. What what is your feedback about like current service mesh implementation? About the maturity needed to implement it? You see. Service mesh has been a very complicated pattern to implement. And that's why providing an easy way, a one-click way to enable service mesh within the organization, it is critical. Service mesh has been a complicated topic, has been hard to use, hard to implement. It doesn't have to be that way, right? That's why we built Kuma, in order to simplify and abstract away all of this complexity. I think that service mesh, you know, five years from now, looking back, service mesh will feel inevitable. Imagine creating modern connectivity and modern applications, but not providing that as part of the infrastructure. The teams are going to be doing it, and they're going to be doing a very poor job at creating all of this connectivity management because it is not their job. Their job is the users, the customers, building the applications. It is not building this underlying connectivity. So I think that service mesh, it's something that, quite frankly, every team should look at because it simplifies, it creates, it, it accelerates the time to market of the, the of the teams. It provides more security, and it doesn't have to be complicated. And I think that everybody should think about it and and educate themselves on service mesh because it is going to feel inevitable five years from now, three years from now, looking back, thinking about doing all of these things that we're doing today without having a service mesh in place. The service mesh abstracts away our connectivity the same way Kubernetes abstracts away the data center. Kubernetes feels inevitable today, but it was a very hard topic for many organizations early in their journey. Service mesh, same thing, but make no mistake, it is something that everybody needs. Do you, for security, do you recommend Open Policy Agent as one of the best options, or is there any other open source tools that that are useful? I'm a big fan and a big believer of, of OPA, and as a matter of fact, we have native integrations with OPA in our product that does not require to run that OPA agent as an additional sidecar. Sidecar. Nobody creates this kind of type of, you know, this is innovation in service mesh landscape. Kong Mesh is the only service mesh that can do that. And I'm a big believer that likewise our teams should not be creating identities and encrypting the traffic or doing, you know, all the things that service mesh provides. I'm also a big believer that the entitlements uh, checking, the out N and out Z permissions can also be abstracted away into a neutral layer that can protect the services from north, south to east, west, thanks to OPA. So I think OPA is something that I'm quite frankly very excited about. And the best way to use OPA is through a service mesh. And that's why OPA and service mesh are sort of, a, it's a good couple. They're married together. Yeah, married together. Thank you very much for that. We are just at the, at the right timing. So if we want to know more things about Kuma, uh, like where do we have to go? Kuma.io. Uh, there is also a community area. There is a Slack channel. There is a bi-monthly, uh, uh, you know, uh, community calls. You know, there is all kind of support that anybody who needs anything to, you know, with Kuma can find. We have two miscellaneous questions. Uh, is it Kuma from Tekken 3? You know Kuma the, the bear? It's Kuma the bear, yes. yes. Uh, Kuma, Kuma, Kuma means bear in Japanese. Oh, and okay. of course, Kong, at Kong, we have something for animals. So we have a gorilla when it comes to the gateway, and, and, and we have a bear when it comes to the service mesh. So the second question is, what's the next animal? <laughs> ah, that's a very good question. It's a confidential information I can't share. <laughs> OK, let's, let's, let's sign an NDA with the API community. Thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> it was great to, Thank you to so be much. with you.